Welcome to academia and the anxious generation, how universities lost the trust of America with Dr. Jonathan Haidt. My name is Harrington Shaw. I'm a senior at UNC and the president of the Student Free Speech Alliance, which is a registered student organization dedicated to promoting free speech policies and a free speech culture at UNC. I'd like to take a moment to say thank you to UNC AFSA for organizing this event and to our friends with Heterodox Heels, the Program for Public Discourse, the Student Free Speech Alliance, and the Carolina Union for their time and effort that made this event possible. Our speaker tonight is Jonathan Haidt. Dr. Haidt is a social psychologist at New York University's Stern School of Business. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992 and taught for 16 years at the University of Virginia. Haidt's research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultures and political groups. His goal is to help people understand each other, live and work near each other, and even learn from each other despite their moral differences. He's co-founded a variety of organizations, including Heterodox Academy, the Constructive Dialogue Institute, and EthicalSystems.org. He's the author of several best-selling books, including The Coddling of the American Mind, which he co-authored with Greg Lukianoff. In 2018, or sorry, 2019, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and was chosen by Prospect Magazine as one of the world's top 50, think top 50 thinkers. He's given four TED Talks. Since 2018, he's been studying the contributions of social media to the decline of teen mental health and the rise of political dysfunction. His next book is called The Anxious Generation, How the Great Re Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic in Mental Illness, which will be published in March. Mark McNeely, professor of the practice and marketing at the Keenan Flagler Business School, will moderate tonight's discussion. Professor McNeely is the co-chair of UNC's Heterodox Heels, one of our co-sponsors, and faculty advisor for the Student Free Speech Alliance. So given the size of tonight's audience, we will be using a virtual platform to facilitate Q&A. You can access the site either through the QR code that was provided at entry or by going to menti, that's M-E-N-T-I dot com, and typing in the code 21810519, and that's available on the ticket you received at entrance. And Emily Putnam Hornstein, distinguished professor in the School of Social Work and also a co-chair of Heterodox Heels, will facilitate that Q&A. And one more thing before we begin, I'd like to call attention to the free speech protections applicable to events like these at UNC. State law requires us to protect the rights of the audience and the speakers to engage in this event. Of course, peaceful protests that do not disrupt the proceedings are part of the free speech process and we welcome those who have different views to join in at the Q&A at the end. Law and university policy prohibit attendees from disrupting the event or interfering with the expressive rights of our speakers and those in attendance. Anyone who does not do so will be asked to leave and continued disruption will result in removal. Thanks for helping us maintain a forum for free expression and robust discourse. With that, let's begin tonight's event. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Haidt. Okay, well, uh, good evening. Um, I'm having uh, vocal cord difficulties for the last couple months, so I'm gonna have to speak quietly into a very amplified microphone. <clears throat> um, so it's customary to start off by saying what a pleasure it is to be here, um, but it really is, and there are some good reasons for that. Uh, when I moved to UVA, my parents retired from the suburbs of New York City to Chapel Hill. They lived in Governor's Club. And so I'd come down here a lot with my kids when they were very young. I have a lot of fond memories of walking around the campus, taking them to the planetarium, and just of the area. I really, really like the area. And then today, uh, Doug, uh, Doug Monroe, where's, oh, there he is, who's, who's, I mean, about as crazy a Carolina booster as you could ever find. You know, he was like, he was like walking me around like, showing me so lovingly every building, every, every feature. Um, and I, I really, and, and then talking with this uh, student group and then with faculty. Um, so my, my son is applying to colleges now and he's, he's not even touching the, the Ivy League schools. They have a terrible culture. Um, he, he only wants schools with good academics, good athletics, good weather. And so basically, <laughs> so he's applied. 
So, uh, so you, you know, UVA and UNC are his top choices, and he'd be thrilled to go to either one. Uh, maybe that was dangerous of me to admit that up front. <laughs> Um, uh, so, um, it really is a pleasure to be here. You have an active um, Heterox Academy group. You have a lot of faculty who are standing up for academic values and pushing back against some of the craziness that I'll talk about tonight. Um, so, uh, so I, I thought, let, me, let me start this way. It always helps to have an example of something analogous. <clears throat> and so, here's a thing that happened around 2015, 2016, there was this weird stuff, the Air Force Academy in particular, um, uh, it seemed to be being taken over by evangelical Christians. And, um, and so this, was, this has been an issue at the Air Force Academy, uh, and it turns out it was even in the broader military, and if you think about that, if the military is gonna become a Christian organization, what do you expect the public to think of it? And so this is survey data, uh, by, by Pew <coughs> showing uh, that, so the percentage of Americans who say that the military is having a negative effect on the US, um, negative effect is, is there, positive effect is there. So what you can see, not surprisingly, uh, is that Christians have long had uh, a very positive view of the military, very little negative. Non-Christians also had a slightly positive view um, up until 2015, and then what happened was that after that, after all this stuff about how the Air Force Academy was becoming very Christian, um, suddenly um, non-Christians lose their faith in the military. Now, none of this is true. I made all of this up. <laughs> but let me show you why. What did happen is that America has many of the world's leading brands one of them is higher education. American universities are the envy of the world. American universities since World War II have been the greatest engines of progress, prosperity, discovery, rising wealth. Um, um, you look at the lists, and this is one compiled in the UK, and they say all the top universities are American except Oxford and Cambridge. So we had an incredible brand, and the key to our brand was intellectual excellence, the smartest people are at these top universities, and absolute honesty. That's essential. If you are a scholar, you must be absolutely honest. Every footnote, everything must be literally true. And as long as we are intellectually excellent and absolutely honest, we are authorities. And people, you'll see, you'll see this, like a study from Harvard said, as if that's an authority, and it was, it used to be. Um, but then what happened? What happened was that at Halloween uh, 2015, there were protests at Yale over an email that Erica Christakis sent out. It led to giant protests, demands to the university president, Peter Salovey, um, that he reform Yale, change this, do that, implement all kinds of policies about identity. Um, and he did, he did all the things he could that were legal. Um, so this led, the, uh, his, uh, this, the success of this protest led these protests to spread around the country. And the 2015 to 2016 year was an incredible year. Now there was a very little violence that first year of the change. But then once Donald Trump was elected, in that semester, there actually was some violence. So at Berkeley, protests over speakers. At Middlebury, actual violence. A professor was injured permanently in her neck. Um, so, and it's still going on. And this was this year at Stanford. Students shouted down a judge who'd been invited to speak at Stanford Law School. These are law students who couldn't stand the possibility of hearing a professor, who hearing a judge, who they'll have to argue in front of. Um, so that brings us back to this graph. This is the real graph. This is what Pew actually asked. What Pew actually asked is uh, what percentage of colleges ha are having a positive versus negative effect on the country. And what you see, not surprisingly, Democrats have always had a very positive view, and Republicans actually were slightly positive <clears throat> all the way up to 2015, much more positive than negative. And then what happened? After years of seeing students screaming at and shouting down conservative speakers, attacking anyone who said anything conservative, um, what do you think happened? They lost their trust in universities. 
But it's much worse than that. That just goes up to 2019. Let's look at what happens when we break it down a little further. Um, when you separate out uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, and you bring in, now this is Gallup data, but very similar, what you see is that even the Democrats are now down on universities, uh, and of course Republicans are, but this I think is, uh, uh, this should be a wake up call. This is incredibly serious, that even independents don't trust universities anymore. They lost their trust, and this was in June. This is not recent, this was in June. What happened since June? Uh, on, by October 8th, it was clear that on campuses, there were many people, it's, you know, it's not a large percentage, but on many campuses, there were students and faculty celebrating the slaughter, celebrating the terrorist attack on Israel. And there were very few college presidents saying anything about it. Whereas they were quick to opine about any issue that, that fit the right political valence. Uh, this is my building at Stern, at NYU Stern. Uh, some students put up the kidnap posters. Other NYU students tore them down. Others put them back up. Uh, and that brings us to these iconic hearings. This is one of the, probably the most important turning point in the history of American higher education was this day, December 5th, when we all saw three heads of t some of the top universities uh, unable to say that, that their university would have a problem with calls for genocide against Jews. Now, it's a complex legal and philosophical issue, but the fact that all of them, some of them specific, especially Claudine Gay, were personally involved in destroying the careers of anyone who said anything that was counter to the narrative made them all seem so hypocritical, so ineffectual. This was a day of national humiliation for American universities. And it got worse. It turns out Claudine Gay plagiarized much of her, she only has a few publications and almost all of them were partly plagiarized, even the acknowledgements. She even plagiarized her acknowledgements from someone else. Um, but it gets worse than that. Because then many academics said, oh well, well, that doesn't count as plagiarism. When any Harvard undergrad would have been expelled instantly for doing a tenth of what the president did. And so the spectacle of the inability to condemn terrorist attacks, the inability to condemn plagiarism, it really exposed the rot in higher education. And this, I think, is an enormously important turning point um, in, in the future of higher education. It's now the case that many people in the country, certainly on the right, it's not just that they don't trust universities, they hate them. Now, they'll still send their kids to them because we're all caught in a status game, but Politically, they hate them, and this has enormous implications, especially in red states. <clears throat> so how did this happen? How did America's universities commit brand suicide in just a few years? That's what I want to talk to you about. <clears throat> I've been studying this problem for a long time, uh, actually since 2011, when I first noticed that in my field of social psychology, everybody was on the left. There were no conservatives. Pardon me, I just have to do a little watering break. Um, so, so I wrote a paper with some other social psychologists just laying out how uh, political diversity will help us do our jobs better. We're getting a lot of things wrong because there's no questioning, no counter stories. Everyone is on the same team. Um, and that paper brought some other professors who shared my view about the problem. We founded Heterodox Academy. That was our original logo. Um, and then, um, unrelated to that, I wrote this paper in The Atlantic with Greg Lukianoff on how the undergrads in the last two years, beginning 2014, were really different. Uh, they were behaving very differently in ways that made it difficult for us to do our work. Um, and then things got so much worse. We published that two months before the Yale meltdown, uh, and so things got so much worse, and we, del we d dove in a lot deeper, and we turned it into a book. We went uh, for much more of an explanation of what, of what happened. So I've been studying this for a long time. I have a lot to tell you. I'm very excited to do so. I just put this talk together from you know, older pieces, but this is the first time I'm giving this, this talk with this structure. 
and I have a, a lot to tell you, so I'll try to move quickly so that we still have time for, for questions and discussion. Um, oh, and then my most recent book also continues on a theme from there, exploring what is, what is going wrong for Gen Z. Oh, available March 26th, pre-order today. Um, so here's the structure of, of the talk. I'm gonna cover three, three threads, three lines of argument, and then those will show us what we can do to make things better. So the first is the mindset of Gen Z. And so I'll tell you a bit about what I'm discovering about Gen Z. Um, so when, especially when I speak to undergrads, I try to introduce the question like this. What's the most fundamental question in life? Just call it out. What do you think is the most fundamental question? Why are we here? What else? What's the meaning of life? Okay, these are great questions, these are big questions. They are not fundamental, literally, because fundament means the foundation, the base upon which everything is built. And as a psychologist, I think the fundamental question in life is approach avoid. Because as soon as life evolved the ability to move, as soon as it went from bacteria to bacteria that had a flagellum that could move, the rest of evolution is which way? And so once you get life moving, you get huge amounts of neural development. Here's a fish brain. Much of that is to figure out which way. Do you follow the light? Do you follow the salt? Do you follow the temperature? Which way? Approach avoid. Now the human brain is so big and so specialized and convoluted, we have uh, whole systems for whole systems for approach. It's not all there, but it's, it's more on the left than the right. So there's a whole approach system, and there's a whole avoid, avoid system. And as soon as you're frightened, as soon as there's a threat, this activates, you shut off anything you're doing, and you want to freeze, get away, defend yourself. Now I'm going to give these more meaningful, uh, meaningful names. Um, uh, so this is what they're called. This is what they're called in psychology, the two systems. But I'm going to call them discover mode and defend mode. And they look like this. When, let's imagine a freshman showing up uh, here at Cal Carolina in sept last September. If they're in discover mode, they're gonna be like, wow, well, look at all these courses I can take. Look at all these activities I can do. You know, I'm like a kid in a candy shop. And you're gonna have this explosion of creativity and growth and change and discovery. Uh, that's what you want. That's how you get the most out of a college education. But what if you arrive in defend mode and you see everything around you is a threat? There's not enough to go around. I have to fight to get what's mine. Um, you're going to look for teammates to keep you safe. And you're going to ask adults to keep you safe. Here you'd say, stand back. You know, unless I really need you, just stand back. Let me, let me explore. What happened to universities in 2014 is that the students arriving all of a sudden we're in defend mode. We'd never seen this before. This shows in 2010 and 2012, when all the students were millennials, these were the rates of these disorders. In 2013, 2014 is when Gen Z shows up. And what, what is it? What changes? It's especially psychological disorders. Their levels of psychological disorder were triple what they had been for the millennials in just a few years. Uh, but it wasn't all psychological disorders. So I'm going to show you a graph here. And all my graphs are the same. They all basically start off in the early 2000s, and you see no sign of an upward trend. So these are the rates for various disorders um, on American college campuses aggregated together. And what happens when we get past 2210, uh, past 2010, um, is, is this. So um, all of the disorders are up. But it's really the dominant thing, par a normal part of being an American college student now is that you are anxious and depressed. Not that the majority are, but around a third, um, a quarter to a third um, are anxious and depressed. By some measures, it's a majority experience anxiety. Um, and you might say, well, you know, the world's threatening and this is hitting everybody. No, it isn't, it's hitting Gen Z. Um, as you see, older people didn't increase their levels of this is anxiety. Um, it's Gen Z and the later millennials. And furthermore, um, it's not both sexes equally. Uh, this shows the rates of major depression for girls and boys. Uh, boys are up. As a percentage, they're up by as much as the, uh, the girls. 
as a, a relatively speaking, but in absolute terms, the number of additional depressed girls dwarfs the number of additional depressed boys. And this, is, this data just came in last week, the data for 2022. I didn't have it until last week, and I noticed something. That little, that little thing up there, 2021, that was COVID. What that means is that COVID was a blip. COVID, the effect of COVID on kids was tiny compared to whatever else was happening since 2012. And it's not all girls. It's surprisingly, it's mostly girls on the left. So very few surveys ask adolescents their politics, but a couple of them do. And in each of those data sets that we have, what we see is this. It's long been known that liberals are, they're a little more creative than conservatives, but that go, they're also a little more anxious, neurotic, less conscientious. There's all kinds of psychological differences. Um, but there's a happiness difference. It's long been known, but it's not big, you know, 1.9 versus 1.7 on, on this scale. So those were the numbers up till 2012. What happens when Gen Z comes into the data set? This. So everyone's up, but it's girls on the left went up first and furthest. Whatever it is that happened, it especially hit girls on the left. In very recent research, I found if you cut it by religious versus not religious, same thing. Religious kids, kids in religious families were not washed away in the early 2010s. Kids in secular families were, or were much more likely to become depressed and anxious. Um, and, so, um, and so this is something we've all noticed. And some of the first signs in 2014, 2015 were that we were all afraid of certain progressive activists on campus. And we found this in Heterox Academy. Students are not generally afraid of the professors, they're afraid of other students. Professors are not generally afraid of professors, they're afraid of the students. So um, something changed, this mess, it's, it's mixed up with our culture war, with left-right politics, and with certain ideas that became common on the left about identity, and I'll talk about that later, identitarianism. I think that's what is, is basically really damaging the mental health of the young people who practice it. Um, now, since I began writing about this, some psychiatrists and researchers said, nah, this is just another moral panic. Uh, don't relax, the digital age is not wrecking your kid's brain. This, this happened to be published the day after my book was, The Coddling. Uh, and so I had to look into it more like, wait, did I get something wrong here? Um, and no, um, we didn't. Um, Greg and I were right. Um, the reason that I can show, the reason that we're sure it's not just self-report, he, he'd been saying, yeah, you see these increases, but that's all self-report. And you know, young people today, they're comfortable saying that they're depressed. That's a good thing. They're not hiding it. That was his argument. But if that was the case, then we wouldn't see it in behavior. We wouldn't see it in hospital admissions and emergency room visits for self-harm. But here is what we see. And as with all the other graphs, no sign of a problem before 2010. And then that happens. Now, this is for girls ages 10 to 14. The numbers are much higher for older girls, but the change is always biggest for the younger girls. 10 to 14 year old, girl, old girls did not used to cut themselves, and now they do. 10 to 14 year old girls did not used to kill themselves. These are, these are suicide rates for that age range, but now they do. In fact, between 2012 and 2013, the rate of suicide for young girls went up 67%. And it wasn't just like a blip, like noise, like up and down. It was on its way up to 134% increase. Something changed radically in the lives of girls, especially right around 2012, 2013. I wonder what that could be. Um, and here's another clue. The exact same thing happened in the same way at the same time in all of the English-speaking countries. So people would say, oh, well, of course they're anxious. You know, the Newtown massacre, the school shootings, they have lockdown drills. Okay, but why did that send girls to the emergency room in New Zealand and Australia and, all, and many other countries around the world? <clears throat> um, so why is this happening with the biggest impact on teen girls? Um, my whole book is about that, about why, but I'll just, because we wanna get back to universities, I'll just cut to the chase. What I believe has happened can only be understood when you look at human childhood, 
we evolved this really long childhood, crazy long childhood, where our brain is mostly done, or at least size-wise, your brain is almost full size by the time you're five. And you have this long period of wiring it up internally. And that has to be done by play. Kids like puppies and kittens and all other young mammals, they play, play, play. That's how they wire up their brains. But we said, no more of that. That's too dangerous. We don't want you out doing this on your own. Sit at home, here's a device. So the end of the play-based childhood uh, took place over a period. Um, uh, you know, in this room, those of you who, are, um, who were born before 1980, if I asked you when were you let out, when could you go outside and play with your friends, I, I've done this 100 times, I know the answer, it's age six to eight, right? By third grade, second grade, you were out playing with your friends. Uh, let me just ask, please raise your hand if you were born after uh, 1995, raise your hand high. Okay, so all of you are Gen Z. Just you, think about what age, like if it was third grade, you'd say eight, if it was fifth grade, you'd say uh, 10. Think about what age you were when you were let out and you could roam around, go out the door, go you know, play in a park, go shopping, whatever, with no adult. Everyone got your number, those of you who are Gen Z? Okay, I'm gonna sweep my finger around the room. When I point to you, just yell it out. Ready, go. Okay, so you see most of it is double digits. It's, you know, it's, it's 10, 12, 14. Now the rest of us, those of us who are older, we grew up when perverts and pedophiles and drunk drivers were everywhere and we didn't really lock them up. And there was a giant crime wave and there was lead everywhere. But we went out and played and we came out mentally healthy. Then in the 90s, we started putting perverts in jail for life and restricting them. We started putting drunk drivers in jail for years. It's incredibly safe to be a child. It's the, the, the death rate is way, way down from where it was in the 60s and 70s when us older people were growing up. But we adults freaked out about child abduction, which doesn't happen in this country. It's always the non-custodial parent. In any case, we stopped, we stopped I, 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 it happens a few times a year, but it's not something that you, people should be thinking about. Um, uh, so we lost that and we replaced it with the phone-based childhood. That's what my book is about. So I can't go into that more now, but again, coming March 26th. Oh, one more thing I wanna show you. This was really cool. I didn't realize this until I wrote the book. Um, it, this is a graph of how quickly people adopt technologies. And the, the modern, the internet as we know it, came in in two waves. So in the 80s and 90s, people were buying PCs and it got much more useful once you could, you had a dial-up modem and you could, you know, download recipes and things like that. So those go up, and what happens to teen mental health? It gets a little bit better, actually, in that period. And what happens to democracy? It gets better. There's more of them, freedom around the world. So the early internet was amazing. Many of us remember how marvelous it was. And then the second wave comes in. That's social media, that begins in 2003, 2004, and then once you get a smartphone, it's this period here, this is the great rewiring, 2010 to 2015, this is when life was radically rewired for young people. This is when Gen Z's mental health collapsed because they now had a phone-based childhood. And if you're a human being, you cannot grow up with a phone-based childhood. It just doesn't work. Um, the clearest evidence of the change is this. This shows us the, percent, the, uh, the minutes per day on average that different age groups spend with friends. Obviously, young, you know, the youngest group, they're hanging out with their friends. These people here, they're married, they have kids, they've got jobs, they're not hanging out with their friends. So that was the story before 2012. But once all the kids get smartphones, what happens? They stop seeing each other. They stop hanging out together. Now look, there's an amazing fact in this, hidden in this data. The 2019 data point is before COVID. The 2020 data point is COVID restrictions. Do you see the effect of COVID? I don't. Because this was falling so fast that COVID didn't really accelerate, it just continued it. What that means is that when all of us were socially distancing, in 2020, Gen Z had been doing it since 2012. 
they were already socially distanced before COVID arrived. And you can't grow up, I shouldn't say you can't, obviously a lot of them have, but it, it, on a generational level, it is devastating for human beings to grow up without spending a lot of time with other kids. And even if, and th those numbers are gross uh, overestimates of the time, because even when they're with other kids, they're on their phones. So there's very little social interaction, very little eye contact compared to what it was before 2010. <clears throat> we start our kids early. We give them, this is a toy iPhone that a friend sent me from the daycare center that his kid goes to. They get toy iPhones as infants. Uh, then we give them real iPhones as toddlers because that will shut them up and we can do our adult stuff. And then by the time they're three or four, we give them multiple screens. Check out this kid. Imagine being, imagine growing up this way. Imagine this level of stimulation as your neurons are trying to find their way in your frontal cortex. So that's my first point. We have messed up a generation. We have messed up the brain development and social development of people born after 1995. And when Gen Z arrived on college campuses, they needed a lot more help, protection, support. Something was very different. All right, second point the telos of the university. So telos is a very useful Greek word if you've ever heard of the word teleology. The telos is the end or purpose for which something is done. So the telos of a knife is to cut. And if I say, here's a knife, it's a great knife. It, it can't cut anything, but it's a great knife. And you would say, well, you've misunderstood what a knife is. Or if I have a doctor friend and I say she's a great doctor. She can't heal anyone, but she's a great doctor. Um, you know, you'd say you, you've misunderstood. So what's the telos of a university? What allows us to say that Carolina or any other school is a great university? Um, this is Raphael's famous painting of the School of Athens. That's uh, Plato and Aristotle. And you see all these people, what are they doing? Are they fighting? Are they joking? They're engaging, they're talking, discussing, presenting ideas, critiquing ideas. That's what, you know, we read Plato's dialogues, like this is what academic engagement is, this kind of interaction, intense, focused, interesting, productive. Um, and so the telos, I would say, it's right there on the crest of our great universities, Veritas, Lux, Lux, Lux and libertas, freedom. So this idea, and a torch. So light, torch, knowledge, passing it on. That's our job. A university that doesn't do that is a terrible university. A university that does that well is a great university. And so once you see that our purpose, our telos, is the discovery and transmission of knowledge, both as scholars and as professors, as teachers, now you understand why universities are set up the way they are, why we think about discussion circles and late night rap sessions and seminars and public events like this one. We're trying to all learn from diverse sources, diverse by race and gender and religion and ethnicity and especially by discipline and I would say by politics. Um, so what we got, what we got in America was this incredible triangle. There is a psychological state called discover mode, and we think of college kids, or many of you remember your college days, as not always happy, but you probably think back on it with some excitement when you arrived. There was a lot of fun. You were learning a lot. So you've got a mindset within an institution, a university, that is organized around this pursuit, and you get this virtuous triangle which no other country has been able to replicate. No other country had universities nearly as good as ours, because they didn't have residential, most of them. You know, it, it's, it's public, you just, you take a bus to school and you go home in the afternoon. But our residential universities really got this. And that's what gave us the brand. That's what gave us the world-changing discoveries, this, this, this incredible triangle. <clears throat> but what happened? All of a sudden, when Gen Z arrived, and I don't want to blame this all on them, but as soon as people arrived in defend mode, asking for trigger warnings, shouting down any speaker that they didn't like, asking for safe spaces to protect them from speakers whose ideas they thought were, were, were hateful, um, 
we had this explosion of all this stuff, safe spaces, microaggressions, bias response teams, everything's about power, call out culture, a single word can end your career. It wasn't like this in 2013, and now it's like this. So that's what Greg and I tried to explain in our book. And at the heart of this all, um, it, it's been bureaucratized into DEI, and I just wanna say, while diversity and inclusion, I think, are important goals, equity is not a salvageable concept because it means equality of outcome, not fairness, but equality of outcome. Um, so that one, I think, can't really be saved. But the key thing is, and I'll get to this again, is the identitarianism. Now, oh, I'll get to this now. Um, so identitarianism, as any ism, it's, 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 it's like worshiping identity. You say identity, a, a per, knowing a person's identity group, um, that's the first move you should make analytically. So let's take 18-year-old American kids growing up in a multi-ethnic democracy, and let's teach them, you know that whole 20th century thing we did about let's judge people less and less by their group. Let's treat people as equal human beings of equal worth. That whole 20th century thing we did, forget it, forget it. Let's teach kids to really focus on what group, what race, what gender, what orientation, and then um, that's the most important thing you should do, that you need to learn to look at society like that. And then, even worse, these groups are not just different, they are differently valuable, they are differently good. So you can see this clearly on the far right. The far right is identitarian. There are actual white supremacists. There are people who think that white people are the best and they should be in charge and they want a revolution that will put white people back in charge as they see it. But left-wing identitarianism is structurally very similar. Um, left-wing identitarianism teaches students to look at this, I'll, I'll, I'll expand that. Um, this is from a figure from the 1990s, from intersection, an intersectionality book. Um, it teaches students to see, you know, is this person white or non-white? Um, are they upper class or poor? Are they cisgender? So you teach students to look in all these binaries and you put a moral valence. So any, whichever end of the binary is above the line, those are the privileged ones. Privileged people have power. Power is evil. They use their power to oppress the good people on the bottom. What a sick thing to teach 18-year-olds coming into college in a multi-ethnic democracy. But that's what we've been doing, especially at elite college campuses since 2014, 2015, since the DEI revolution. Uh, and the point of intersectionality is you have to see the locus of, con of, of, of converging identities. And so the ultimate evil person is the cisgender straight white male. They're the cause of our problems. And this whole idea of saying, you know who the cause of the problems are? Them, that group. That does not have a good history for our species. So what happened to us, I believe, after 2015 is that we lost sight of our telos, which is the pursuit of truth, and our universities caved. Well, we had people coming in in defend mode, so now the triangle doesn't work, and explicitly pursuing social justice, uh, which is advocacy. It's not the discovery of truth. It's changing existing power structures. So if you have people in defend mode hell-bent on changing existing power structures within the university, now you've got complete incoherence because it doesn't work. It can't be reverse engineered to work. So to give you an example, what's the telos of a refrigerator? To keep food cold. A good refrigerator will do a good job of keeping food cold. But what if you said, well, I've got this refrigerator, but what I really, really want is a bathtub. So I'm gonna make my refrigerator into a bathtub. Give it a different purpose. You can do that. You could lie it on its back, plug up the holes, pour water in it, and you could take a bath in there. But it's a really bad bathtub. And that's what this kind of activism has done to our elite schools. It's taken these schools that were structured around the pursuit of truth and it's tried to give them a new telos of social justice. 
and the leadership at many schools went along. Now, I know for a fact they didn't like it. I've spoken to a lot of university presidents, but they felt powerless. They felt it was just too strong. The forces were too strong. They had to give in. And so um, part of the incoherence, the teleological confusion, why are we doing this? Who are we? The idea that professors would say, well, you know, sometimes plagiarism is OK. And they would say, oh, everyone does it, which is not true. It is absolutely not true. So this horrible spectacle, this degrading, humiliating spectacle, destroyed our brand. It was already on the downward slope. But this, the fall of 2023, is when higher education in America reached rock bottom as a trusted brand. Uh, because when you focus on identity, you lose academic excellence. Now, you don't have to. I'm not saying diversity is incompatible. I'm just saying the way we currently do it now with all of these rigid tests and exclusions, and we will only hire people of one race for one job, these sorts of things, you can't reconcile that with, with excellence the way we do it now. Um, furthermore, you can't reconcile it with honesty because anyone who says anything that is true but incompatible, that's how you get canceled. In fact, most of the big blow-ups were people who, like Eric Christakis, they wrote a caring, thoughtful memo based on their academic field opposing a DEI policy. That's how most of the people got canceled early on. It was progressives who questioned DEI. So this whole thing, this whole identitarian DEI has mired us. It's taken us away from excellence and honesty. Why should anyone trust us? Why should anyone on the right trust us? We're just part of the blue team. So that's my second point. Uh, my third point, um, structural stupidity. And this is actually, well, they're all, I think they're all important, but this one kind of explains the other two. Um, so, <clears throat> oh, hold on a second. All right, so um, as academics, we've long had a self-conception that we're bold, we're fearless, it used to be good to be called provocative, um, and so this is, this is emblazoned all over at UVA, this, this quote. Um, <clears throat> and also we have this conception that what we're doing is actually fun. You read Plato's dialogues, they were having fun. I mean, it was playful, it was witty, it was sharp, it was brilliant. Um, and there used to be, older people here will remember the magazine Lingua Franca. Raise your hand if you remember that magazine. It was playful. It had academic jokes. It had you know, inside gossip. It's been really fun to be a professor. I've loved it until 2015. Then it was a lot less fun. But before 2015, it was really fun to be a professor. Um, and then something hit us. Now, to go a little deeper, um, it's, America has been subject to these great awakenings. Uh, these religious revivals, and humans are subject to them. Humans are, are, are intensely social creatures. We get periodically swept through by just like by diseases like COVID and by various religious ferments that sort of take over. Um, and many people notice, Matt Iglesias, I think, coined the term the Great Awakening because wokeness really came in like a, like a tsunami around 2015. <clears throat> um, and John McWhorter has been really great on this. Um, he was one of the first to say this new morality is very much like fundamentalist Christianity, only without any of the good parts. <clears throat> um, I've been, my piece that I'm adding to this um, is I'm tracing this to some small changes in our, uh, in the way we connect. So before 2009, there was no like button, no retweet, no algorithms. It was just chronological feed. And we called them social networking systems because you'd connect with people. Once you get the like button, the retweet button, algorithms, now everything is explosive, viral. Anything can go viral. And now we call them social media platforms because you don't connect with people. You stand there and put stuff out, hoping to be outrageous enough that it will go viral and you'll get prestige. So that, I think, that change, which really kicks in by 2013, 2014, the hyperviral internet, that, I believe, um, is why we went crazy. 
not just on college campuses, but it seems like everywhere is just going crazy. Uh, you look in uh, journalism, uh, museums, um, Congress, uh, there's a level of fragmentation and dysfunction that is beyond anything I could have imagined 15 years ago. So I had an Atlantic article where I tried to explain all this. Um, and a key insight, the, the engineer at Twitter who built the retweet button, um, he, he said afterwards when the, he watched Twitter mobs form, he said, we just handed a loaded weapon to four-year-olds. And so the metaphor that I use from this is it's not exactly a gun. You know, if someone tweets some accusation against you, it's not, it doesn't kill you, but it hurts. A hit to our reputation often hurts more than an actual dart in our flesh. Um, so imagine if in the early 2010s we distributed dart guns. Everybody gets a dart gun, infinite numbers of darts. And the more darts you shoot into people, the more we pay you. You can earn money by shooting darts into people. And most of us say, I don't want to do that. But some people say, yeah, let me at them. Those bastards, I'm going to shoot and shoot and shoot. Um, and so what happened is especially it's the far left, the far right trolls who are just jerks, and Russian agents. Those four really benefited from Twitter and other platforms. They shot lots and lots of darts. And that's why all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we were all walking on eggshells. Because one word, one idea, one joke in a lecture can be the end of our career. So the college faculty's new focus, don't offend. Same thing for the students, walking on eggshells. This is a student at Smith. I'll just go to the second part. Uh, she began to voice her opinion less often to avoid being berated and judged. I learned, along with every other student, to walk on eggshells for fear that I may say something offensive. It wasn't like this in 2013, and by 2016 it was. And so my analysis as a social psychologist who has been studying John Stuart Mill, who talked about the importance of viewpoint diversity, who said he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. So as I began to think about well, what happens when everyone has a dart gun and everyone's walking on eggshells and everyone's afraid, what happens? And the term that I coined is structural stupidity because you have very smart people but you put us together in a, in a room and we can either think great thoughts together or we can be afraid of each other and, and, and think things but not say anything and become collectively stupid. And so what I see happening is that the far left, of course they shoot the far right, but th that doesn't really hurt them. Most of the darts go into the moderate left, people like me. Um, well, um, the far, so, so the far left is shooting its dissidents and then they go quiet. And when you see ridiculous things being said in academic context, you think, wait, that's clearly wrong, but you don't say anything. And this is, this is bipartisan. The far right does the same thing. Um, the far right, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, over here, if you do anything wrong, they'll call you racist. If you do anything here, they'll call you a traitor, and they'll issue death threats. So it's really scary to dissent from either side. And then people in the middle went quiet long ago. Um, so the way this is played out in our society is because the left generally dominates in all of the epistemic institutions, the knowledge generating institutions. If it's about words and knowledge and research, then it's hiring graduates of elite schools and PhDs and people with a very particular set of values. So all of these things blew up at the same time in the same way as universities did, just a little, bit a a little after us. On the far right, on the right, I think we see it um, in Congress. They've literally gotten rid of every moderate. Um, they got rid of, uh, immediately got rid of all the people who voted not to impeach Trump, although the Democrats helped them do that to their shame. Um, so both sides are doing it, and that means our country is really running off the rails. Um, you know, we, you know it's, it's, it's not just on campus anymore. All right, so that's my explanation of, of what happened. There's a lot more to it, but at least I wanted to convey to you three points that I thought would be interesting and, and conveyable. <clears throat> so what do we do? Um, there's a lot we can say here, but I'm, I thought, let's try, let's try just looking at these and reversing them. So what if, what if I just flip the words? What if discover mode were to replace defend mode? What if truth were to replace social justice? What would happen? How could we do that? Um, and so there's some simple things that, that we can do. Um, <clears throat> Um, so for one thing, um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, 
is incredibly effective. More importantly, it's dirt cheap and easy to do. So the research shows it's not necessarily more effective than other forms of psychotherapy, but you can do it yourself. Just read a book. There, there's, there, read, here, read this book. So you can either hire, you can either hire a psychologist like Seth Gillihan for 150,000 a year, but you're gonna need 20 of him or 40, because a third of your students need, need therapy. Um, or for $4,000, you could buy 400 copies of his book and give, you know, give one to every incoming freshman, whatever the number is, is here. So teaching CBT, I think, would be incredibly cost-effective, effective, and it's not just about mental illness. It's about good thinking. CBT is about recognizing cognitive distortions like overgeneralization, um, mind reading, uh, catastrophizing. So there's a lot we can do to improve mental health. Um, within Heterodox Academy, originally, we created a program called, Perspe called Perspectives, which is now we, have, we split off into what's called the Constructive Dialogue Institute. Um, but it, it basically takes insights from moral psychology from my book, The Righteous Mind, and it shows students, it's made especially for college freshmen, coming into a, a university, it works for high school as well, high school seniors. Um, here's why we have trouble understanding each other. Here's confirmation bias, motivated reasoning. Here's how to start a discussion so that you don't get off. You know, so we teach them the skills of talking across divides, all kinds of divides, um, and, we give, and we educate them also about the psychology of it. So I hope you'll try that at Carolina. Um, it's, it's being used at about 50 universities around the country now. In the last year, we've had a lot of uptake. Um, so please, if there's anyone here who has anything to do with freshman orientation or anything like that or, or, or student life, please visit constructivedialogue.org. It just walks you through the inner workings of the mind, why we differ, intellectual humility, importance of diverse perspectives. You know, uh, so it just guides you through. It's, um, and it's, it's six modules each about, or eight modules, each about a half hour long. It's not, it's not a very long course. Um, so there's a lot we could do to address that, and we should, just for humanitarian reasons, we have a mental health crisis. Second, what would it take for truth to replace social justice on universities that have become social justice universities? Now here, the key is leadership. So when Dorian Abbott, a, a, physicist, a biophysicist or astrophysicist at Chicago, when his talk was canceled at MIT because he had written an essay in Newsweek that was critical of DEI, that's all. So someone at MIT objected, some dean, mid-level dean of something or other, shut down the talk, but to its eternal shame, after there was an outcry about that from MIT faculty and alumni, the president, who we all saw testifying to Congress, the president and the administration doubled down and defended the dean, and they canceled his talk because he once said something that someone was offended by. Not in his research, just as a professor, he wrote something once. Um, so that was a shame. That brought shame to MIT. So how can higher ed escape this shame after shame? I mean, since 2015, the videos of what's happening on campus, the videos of college presidents not standing up are so shameful, and they are so delightful to people on the far right, Fox News, all the networks that make fun of the left. Um, the Evergreen meltdown was the worst, where they took the president hostage, they cursed at him, they held him prisoner, he, he, he didn't object, he went along, he did everything they told him to. Um, so what we've saw for the last uh, eight years is a lot of weak leaders who are afraid of their students, they do not punish bad behavior so they get more of it, um, they accept the protesters' narrative about what the school is, they validate that story, and they, and they show that intimidation pays. You can get your way, you can shut down a talk, you can achieve your ends by intimidation and threats. This is a terrible lesson for us to be teaching on campus. Um, there are about three or four presidents in the last eight years, well, before this year. There are three or four that I know of that actually didn't do that. Uh, and so um, th they're not afraid of their students. They ac they're, they're academics. They acknowledge that the protesters often have a point. Let's talk about it. So the, uh, the president of Oberlin, one of the most uh, progressive schools in the country, when the, when the students came in and gave him a list of demands and demanded that he fire this person and that person, um, he said, some of these demands resonate me, with me, but I will not respond to any document that rejects the notion of collaborative engagement. He says it contains attack. He defended his faculty. No president has done that practically. When students want a, fac a faculty member fired, almost no president has defended them. 
So there are only a few cases until recently of really strong, clear um, um, uh, uh, leadership. Leaders have to guard the telos of truth. It, that's part of their job. The leader of any organization is responsible for the culture of that organization. Leaders should talk about anti-fragility and viewpoint diversity. Uh, as president, uh, of the first African-American president of an Ivy League school, Ruth Simmons, said, learning is the antithesis of comfort. We're not going to give you a safe space. You, you're not, we're not going to try to protect you from ideas that make you uncomfortable. Um, uh, and third, um, leaders have to respond wisely to crises. I won't go through this in detail, but what happened, especially in the age of Twitter, is as soon as something blew up on Twitter, the leadership would react, and that was a mistake. Slow down, because the mob is gonna move on tomorrow, so don't act today. Um, and finally, um, what if curiosity and love of learning were to replace fear? Uh, our new president at HXA, John Tomasi, wrote a beautiful essay on Curiosity University. You know, here I've been saying for years the telos is truth or truth-seeking, and he's been saying, well, you know, maybe, yeah, but maybe it's actually curiosity, or at least curiosity is an essential virtue. And so he has this beautiful essay, you can look it up, um, about what curiosity is and how central it is to what we do. Now, of course, if students are in defend mode, they're not curious. You can't be curious and afraid at the same time. You have to have the, the approach system, the um, explore mode. Um, and so, um, so I urge you all, many of you already are, but I urge you, those of you who are faculty or administration, um, please join Heterodox Academy. We have all, we, we created all kinds of tools to study what's going on. We created this amazing edition of John Stuart Mill's On Liberty so that undergrads can really understand it. We stripped out a lot of the arcane language and, and condensed it. Um, we have a really fun conference uh, every it's coming up June 6th. Um, please raise your hand if you're already a member of, of Heterodox Heels. Please raise your hand. Okay, so look around. There's a lot of members here. Um, please raise your hand if you are faculty or administration here at the university. Raise your hand high. Okay, so everyone who wasn't a member of HXA, please join. It's, there are no, no dues. Um, you just agree. You just say that you agree with the principle that you're going to support viewpoint diversity and open inquiry. Um, so please come join us. We really are bringing change at, at, at universities across the country. Um, and, um, and yes, so here, this, this is the, um, the website for the, the UNC chapter. Um, we also, we just are opening a Center for Academic Pluralism. So if you want to spend a semester or a year in New York City and your work has anything to do with academic pluralism, please apply. We have a big grant to support people. It's really fun. You get to, you, you know, every Friday there's a seminar. You, you meet with the other, the other fellows. Um, so in conclusion, what I've told you is that we had this incredible brand and we blew it. We completely blew it between 2015 and 2023. Um, I've given you my analysis that at least these three factors, these three th threads are what brought us to ruin, and I've suggested that it's not too late to reverse course. I think there are many schools that cannot reverse course. UNC is not one of them. UNC is really, really promising from what I see here, from what I know about the university and its history. Um, so I think schools like UNC, especially schools in the South and the Southwest, have a, a special advantages regionally. They have a lot more viewpoint diversity. Most people are on the left, but so what? The problem isn't balance. The problem is a kind of a fearfulness that is common in the Northeast and on the West Coast. So UNC really can lead the way and is doing a great job of it, I think. Um, and that's my talk. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Great. We'll do a couple of questions uh, here, and then we're going to turn it over to some audience Q&A. So following the post-October 7th unrest on campus and the House hearings that you mentioned, right? Um, a number of thought leaders, Steven Pinker, uh, Fareed Zakaria, um, Barry Weiss, Ray, put forth a number of ideas about reforming universities, things like you mentioned, Ray, restor restoring uh, the pursuit of truth, institutional neutrality. One that they talked about, though, was diminishing the influence of DEI bureaucrats and ideologies that diverge from the pursuit of truth and academic integrity. Do you agree with that? And then if so, how, how do we do that? 
Yes, I do agree with it. Um, I used to take a very nuanced view and say, well, you know, some parts of it might have some justification, other parts not. You know, let's let's be empirical. Let's do the things that are that clearly are working. Um, but actually, no part of it is demonstrably working. A lot of it is backfiring. And now that we see just how deep it goes, now that we see when you teach kids to see in a certain way and you emphasize identity, the inevitable outcome in terms of anti-Semitism is Jews are white, Jews are oppressors. It's okay to kill Jews because that's just resistance. That's what, and you know, and that's what some of the professors said. This is what uh, decolonization looks like. Is October seventh. Um, so I now think that identitarianism is completely incompatible with the mission of the university. Any organization that embraces identitarianism becomes mired in conflict. There are a number of essays about this. Progressive organizations in this country are mired in conflict because everyone's upset because someone said something that offended them. And so I think there's no future uh, for DEI as long as it's based on identity, identity groups, identitarianism. Um, for starters, what I suggest is get rid of the entire thing, get rid of all the departments, and put some of the money into an office of the ombuds, like an ombudsman. Um, it does make sense if you have a lot of diversity, you're gonna have a lot of misunderstandings. So it does make sense to do things to help the students learn how to deal with people who are different. What we do now with DEI is we create moral dependency. I've got my NYU ID on my pocket. On the back of the ID, it says for emergencies, 911. For police campus safety, here's the number. For bias response line, here's the number. Meaning, it's that important. If a professor says something that offends you, call it in, text it in, website, whatever, file a report. This is insane. This is just completely unworkable. So we have to get rid of identitarianism. We can still pursue diversity, which includes race and gender. It, well, gender is at, actually most students at every level are, are women now. So actually, yeah, we need more gender diversity in a lot of fields, frankly. Um, um, but I think especially viewpoint diversity and political diversity would really benefit us. Okay, great, thank you. So one of the discussions we have going on on campus is that the university uh, should be left to govern itself. Um, yet you showed with your data how the trust in universities has declined. Um, how much of that is a result, do you think, of the academy governing itself, and what is the proper balance between outside oversight and self-governance? Um, so um, it sure sounds appealing to be self-governing, and it's very much the American ethos, uh, not top-down. We're not like the French model where everything's directed from the center. Um, so that was a very appealing idea. And there's a line from Bill Clinton that I used to quote, he said, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with what's right about America. And until about three or four years ago, I used to quote that and say, there's nothing wrong with universities that can't be fixed with what's right about universities. Because we, we can study this. We can see what works. We can make intelligent policies. I no longer believe that. Um, I now think what we need is diversity of academic structures. So I'm, a, I'm on the advisory board of the University of Austin, which is an attempt to create a totally new university from scratch without the problems. I'm not saying that's the way to go. I'm saying, yes, we need that, and we need 20 of them. And of course, you know, there, there's a limit to how many they can educate. We can't give up on our university, especially our big state universities, which educate you know, most, of the, most of the students who go to school. Um, so I'm hopeful that what we'll see is schools like UNC, schools uh, where schools that really, that have not succumbed to the, the craziness the way, say, Brown or, uh, you know, well, well, at Cornell, I would say yes, but the, there the alumni are actually fighting back. So I'd say what, um, um, I'd say yeah, what we need is different ways forward, and the self-governance model has a very, very serious problem, which is, um, you know, in a, <laughs> In a, lo in a town which is self-governing, the people get to vote and the town and the leadership should represent the town. So there are safeguards built in in a democracy where if the leadership is like crazy far right or left, the people can vote them out of office. But an academic department is not like that. So anthropology is such a brilliant field. I love anthropology and sociology. 
But those two fields are some of the furthest left, most activist fields in the main parts of the academy. And the studies fields, you know, gender studies, all the studies fields, those were explicitly created for activism, not scholarship. Um, so they don't represent anyone. And who do they hire? Whoever they want, it's up to them. So I think that we've dug ourselves in a hole, especially with the studies departments, where there is no way to reform them from the outside. So I think they do need to, uh, well, I, I don't want to say this was being recorded, but um, I think it's a serious issue, and I think self-governance is not able to deal with it. Okay. Um, it was reported that at Brown University, um, they arrested 41 students for shutting down the administration building and said the university is prepared to escalate the level. When was this? When, um, I think this was earlier, This I think this was around uh, after post-October 7th. Oh, good, okay. Yeah, and so they escalated the level of criminal charges for future incidents at University of uh, Massachusetts Amherst. 51 students were arrested for shutting down their administration building. University of Chicago, 26 students. University of Michigan, 40 students. Um, those universities seem, though, to be the exception to the rule. The majority of administrators around the country really refuse to arrest or charge right. students. So what's What's the proper approach for administrators, and, yeah. and what are the implications for universities going forward, mm -hmm. both internally, but also how they're viewed by the public? Yeah. So I'm, uh, one of my most important influences is Emil Durkheim, the sociologist Emil Durkheim, 120 years ago, who said that crime is very, very important sociologically because of how it's responded to. And when the state or the people respond to crime, that sends a signal that we don't tolerate this. And if you don't respond to it, that sends a signal that you do respond to it, and that really rips apart the community. And from 2015, when this all started, through 2020, the number of students, you know, of all the thousands of, you know, the shout downs, the terrible behavior, the intimidation, the number of students who had any kind of punishment is about 12 at Claremont McKenna. That's it. Nobody was ever punished. Nobody was ever expelled, no matter what they did. And that's cowardice, I believe. Um, we need to treat shoutdowns as the most severe obstruction of the academic telos possible. So I was delighted uh, by the, 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 the North Carolina law that was read about how, you know, we, you know, the law here says that I get to speak, you can hold placards, but if you prevent me from speaking, you're wrong and you're going to be punished for it. Something will happen to you. Um, so I'm really encouraged that you know, before 2023, 12 students maybe got a slap on the wrist. And after October 7th, hundreds and hundreds are. Most university presidents are true liberals. They, that is, they believe in free speech, they believe in the mission of the university, they've just been afraid to punish anyone, and now they're not. So that's very, very hopeful. Okay, great. I'll ask you one more question, then we're gonna go to audience Q&A. Um, so I'm going to take you past, you, you're gonna, you've talked about Gen Z and where Gen Z is going, and I want to take you a little bit beyond that into the future. So thought leader Yuval Harari said in the New York Times, social media was the first contact with AI, between the AI and humanity, um, and humanity lost. And looking towards the future, we expect each child to grow up with AI tutors, AI friends, and even AI romantic partners. Is this a good or bad thing, and assuming it's inevitable, um, what features would childhood AI companions need to facilitate good long-term outcomes for the children using them? Yeah, so it's this assuming it's inevitable thing that really gets me. Um, so, you know, I always hear this, oh, the train's left the station, the kids are on social media, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna keep them off? Um, and, you know, we used to give kids um, um, opium. Um, you know, there were all kinds of patent medicines you give your kid um, heroin or opium, and they, not heroin, but opium, they get quiet. Uh, and then we discover, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. Um, and kids used to be able to smoke. When I was a kid, you could just buy cigarettes in a vending machine, so kids smoked. And we thought, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. Maybe we should raise the age. Um, and now it turns out that when you give a kid a phone, you're now blocking off everything else in life. They're gonna sleep less, see people less, play less, um, get less sunlight, get less time in nature. Um, and so rather than saying, well, what are you gonna do? I say, let's do something. Um, and so the, the four norms that I suggest in my book, because we're all stuck in a collective action problem. Nobody wants their kid on Instagram, but the kid says, mom, everyone else is on Instagram. I have to be or I'm cut out. So we're all stuck in a trap. How do you get out of it? Collective action. So here are the four norms that I propose in the book. Norm number one, no smartphone before high school. Just give them a flip phone. No smartphone before high school. 
they can still communicate, but they can't get lost in a phone when they have to press the seven key three times to make the letter S. So no smartphones before high school. Second rule, no social media before 16. Now here we really, really need the federal government to raise the age. Utah, a few states have tried it. Probably there'll be all kinds of legal complexities. But the federal government made a ridiculous law in 1998 saying you have to be 13 to sign a contract with a company that lets them have your data as a child and use it for profit. The law says 13, it's a ridiculous law. And there's zero enforcement. So raise the age to 16 and enforce it, require age verification. So no social media before 16. Third norm is phone-free schools. Phones in a kid's pocket are a complete disaster. They block everything in school. Kids are texting, they're watching porn, they're doing TikTok challenges, and grades are going down. Americans are literally getting stupider. Our test scores were rising for 50 years till 2012. Now they're going down. It's not just COVID. Um, uh, so that's the third norm, phone-free schools. The fourth norm is far more free play and childhood independence. Now you might say, well, what about with an AI friend? To which I say, so far, what the tech industry has given us in terms of virtual relationships has not only been completely poisonous, but they are lying sacks of garbage who are giving it to us. And we saw that in the, in the testimony uh, in Congress last week, two weeks ago. So how about if we trust them now to give the next generation of human beings all of their social contacts? How's that gonna work out? And so I do not think this is inevitable. I think this is the worst thing we could possibly do for our kids. Since most of us love our kids, I think we shouldn't do it. So, is this mic? Yes, it is, perfect. Um, so now we're gonna do the audience Q&A. I get to be the voice of the audience. We have 42 questions, so we're gonna do Something's wrong with the. See, something's wrong with the mic. There's some feedback. I think. Try it again. Let's see if it. Better. Okay. okay. Perfect. Um, how do you reconcile the dissonance between advocating for university presidents to speak out against Hamas, but also believing in institutional neutrality? So, well, I think you have to pick one and be consistent. So, at the University of Chicago, they had the Calvin Report. They made it clear totally clear that the mission of the university is to be a platform on which people can argue, and that's what we do at a university. So they said long ago, we don't make statements about divestment, divert, uh, we, you know, we just, you know, we only make a statement if it's really core to the mission of the university. So if you're gonna be consistent, um, that will be fine if you don't make a statement about the Hamas attack, if that's your policy. There'd be plenty of other people on campus who are. The leader cannot speak for the university except in a very, very limited capacity. So what we saw since 2015 is every time there was a major setback for the left, the university president, not every time, but often like you know when Trump won, when a Supreme Court case went a certain way, the president would say, we are grieving, you know, we are all upset. Like really? You know, a third of your people are actually on the other side, or a quarter of them at least, really? Um, so I think institutional neutrality makes a lot of sense what those presidents testifying before Congress, what they were pilloried for is their hypocrisy. Them saying, oh yes, you know, we will, you know, it depends on context, you know, we're free speech. You know, you can call for genocide in some contexts, but not others. Really? You know, you can't, you can't use the wrong pronoun for someone without getting destroyed or expelled, but you can call for genocide? There was a Babylon Bee article you know, the satirical w magazine, it was Harvard student leaves lecture on microaggressions to attend Kill the Jews rally. Um, you make a causal claim that the decline in trust of U.S. universities is due to student protests. What about Republican political leaders who have attacked elites as the primary cause? Yes, but let's look at the timing. So before 2015, Republicans, I mean, there was always culture war stuff, you know, um, always the claim that universities were on the left. So this is not new. And there have been three waves of political correctness and then a right-wing reaction to political correctness, one in the 60s, 70s, one in the early 90s, and then this one. Um, <coughs> and um, uh, wait, I'm sorry, wait, wait, the specific question again was? The now I 
I just closed it. <laughs> Hang on yeah. one second. <laughs> Um, here we go. You make a causal claim, the decline in trust of U.S. Oh, universities. Yes, the, yes. that's right. The uh, what the about Republican, Republican political yeah, leaders that's right. who've okay, attacked yes. the league? Yep. Yeah. So, um, so one thing that I learned from uh, the great intellectual historian Jerry Mueller is that in every era, in every country, the right is always a reaction to the excesses of the left. And so um, what came first was the excesses of the left on campus, and those were covered uh, in, on Fox News and all the other networks. Um, and then after a couple years of that, then we started seeing legislatures now getting more active. So, uh, so you know, we live in a culture war. Um, you know, for every action, there's an equal, and I'm sorry, for every action, there's a m much bigger and opposite reaction, and it just pings back and forth. Um, so I think, as in most cases, sort of progressives, and I don't mean all progressives, and I, I used to always be on the left, now I'm just nothing, I'm just trying to study this. but. Um, the, the, the activist faction on the left is what does things that then trigger an authoritarian response from some people on the right. There's great work by Karen Stenner on how to trigger the authoritarian impulse that's present in about a third of the population. One of the best things you can do to make people want an authoritarian or even fascist leader is to have an open border and to encourage illegal immigration. That's the most powerful thing you can do to strengthen the far right. And the left has been doing that for a long time. What should UNC and other universities do to address administrative bloat? Administrative bloat? Um, I was about to say it's above my pay grade because <laughs> I only think about moral, political, juicy issues, not, but, but actually Greg and I have a chapter in the coddling on bureaucracy because that is a big part of it. And you know, it used to be that there were more professors than administrators, and now it's nothing, it's nowhere close. Um, so the administrative growth has been extraordinary. And some portion of that is because governments keep passing laws that require certain things. Um, so America has a huge problem. There's a guy named Philip Howard, a great attorney, who's been writing books on how law is strangling us. We're, we're losing our dynamism. So some of it is just the, the national problem of overregulation, bloat. Um, but a lot of it is specifically DEI. Um, a huge amount has been spent on DEI. And DEI bureaucracies, I think, are the ones that cause the most damage because the other ones just waste time and money. The DEI bureaucracy really makes us walk on eggshells. Are too many people going to college? Yes, definitely. Um, the idea that everyone should get a college education is absurd. Um, there are lots of things that people can do with their lives. And because, as I said before, um, schools are incredibly structurally sexist. Schools are designed for girls. School, you sit in a chair, you learn, um, you, uh, you don't get much recess anymore. Um, federal prisoners, maximum security, get two hours a day. Our kids get 30 minutes a day of recess in elementary school. Um, so schools are really bad for boys. Boys are dropping out. Boys are not going to college as much. 60% of college students are girls. Uh, same thing, it's it, similar numbers for masters and PhD. Um, and so a lot of people who've studied this have said, boys more likely are wanna work with their hands. They like to fix things. Vocational schools, there used to be shop class. There used to be auto mechanics. Um, if you, the idea that everything should be about college prep is wrong, it shouldn't be. People have different talents. There's a place for people in the economy, and if we funnel everybody through the, try to get them through the top universities, we end up with a crazy-making competition for an education that isn't gonna help a lot of the people who get it, and is gonna waste a lot of money and crush a lot of souls. So no, uh, and especially, my God, now that universities are so bad, no, I definitely don't think that everyone should go to university. <laughs> What's the problem with power being a crucial analytic lens? Oh, a crucial is fine. Um, I, I, have, I once told the story about this weird week I had where on Monday I went to university and it was like this like totally Freudian university. And at that university, everybody said everything is about sex. And they taught their students to analyze everything. You know, what looks like love, what looks like power, what looks like here, everything is sex. And I thought, that's really sad that these students are learning to see everything. Everything, not everything is sex. And then the next day, I went to a university where it was like total free market. They had a statue of Milton Friedman. 
everything was about markets and individual pursuit of, 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 of money. And, and I talked with the students there, and it was really sad because that's a powerful perspective, and sometimes it's right. But it's not everything, and you're warping kids' minds if you say everything is about money. And then I went, and you, know, you get the point. This didn't really happen. But you know, I went, you know, and then I went to an evolutionary universe. Everything was evolution. And then on Friday, I went to one where everything was power. And I had to say to the students the same thing. Power sometimes matters. Sometimes it is the best lens. Usually not, because nothing is everything all the time. Like, so um, I, I called my essay something about like against monomania. And the power people are monomaniacs. You know, they think the way to understand a parent-child relationship is as power. Like, are you not a human being? What are three actions the UNC trustees should take to address the challenges outlined in your talk? Oh boy, this is a very, very <laughs> difficult and tricky one, as I probably shouldn't say anything. I'll just explain the reason why I'm not gonna say much. Um, because as I understand, again, I just, I just know a little bit, but um, we are in the middle of a culture war in which the left control, it's like a game of Stratego, the left controls certain properties, the right controls certain properties, um, and of course in this state, the, the right now controls the, uh, the, the board, whatever, uh, but you have a democratic governor, so it's complicated. Um, and um, uh, from what I've heard, so some of the steps they've taken, I think have been very positive. This new school that you have uh, for s s School, school for Civic Life and Leadership. Yeah, s boy does America need that. Boy, I, you know, if, if imagine if you're an employer and you can employ either someone who was an anthro major who majored in protest versus someone who went to the school of, who are you gonna employ? Um, so I think some of the moves have been very positive. Now, um, in a culture war, if you do it in a heavy handed way, you're gonna cause a strong reaction from the faculty and not just for left right reasons, but because you are meddling in what we perceive to be our domain. So in talking with the heterodox uh, heels group, we talked a bit about procedural fairness. Um, that is the importance of people seeing that whatever's happening is done by a legitimate process. So um, I do, you know, I, I, four years ago I said, I, I want governments to stay out of this, let universities try to solve this. When you make it political, it's always bad. But I now think that universities can't, can't do this on their own. So I actually do think that they need some push, some, some pressure, some counter pressure. Uh, but I can't comment on the specific things. Just, um, yeah, I, 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 won't, I shouldn't go any further. I feel like since you took a good stab at that, we should let you off the hook on any other questions. So I'll give you a very easy one. Um, uh, what does truth seeking mean to you? Do you think there is such a thing as truth? And, and I am joking, uh, so, but. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, no, you know what? I would actually love to address that. Um, so there are, there are several kinds of truth. There's some truth which is non-anthropocentric. That is, it's true regardless of whether people ever existed. So Earth is the third planet from the sun, and if intelligent aliens come here from another planet, they will find that. Um, other things are only true because of who we are. So strawberries are sweet because of our evolution and our tongues, whereas dogs don't like strawberries at all. Um, so it's true that strawberries are, stu are sweet, but that's an anthropocentric truth. Other truths are emergent. Um, truths about markets, truths about norms, certain things are morally right or wrong because of how we live now. And that doesn't mean that our ancestors were wrong for 50,000 years until five minutes ago. Things change and then what can be morally true given the way people live. And so, um, so I do think there is such a thing as there's many different kinds of truth. Some, there, I'm, not saying every, I'm not saying your truth, my truth. I'm saying there are different categories of truth. And some of them are very, very hard to find. And our brains are built to not let us find them because our brains are built for tribalism. And so it takes a special institution to take you out of your tribal mindset, to engage with others, to contemplate what is the best system is capitalist free market democracy really the best? It's a kind of a religious devotion for us, but it shouldn't be. We should be able to question that. And you can only question that if you meet actual people who believe other things. So yes, the, the easy truths are the ones studied by the chemists and the physicists. Those are non-anthropocentric. Those just sit there and let you study them. The harder ones about how to have a good society, 
That's been the basis of philosophical inquiry and academic inquiry since the time of the ancient Greeks. It still is just as important today, and we need good functioning universities with viewpoint diversity, people not walking on eggshells, good leadership, smart people, lots of resources. If we get that, we can find truth together. Thank you. Great. Yeah. <laughs> It's now time to wrap up tonight's event, so thank you so much, Jonathan, for coming and your timely and thoughtful insights this evening. Uh, at this point, we have some guests in the first, second, third, and fourth rows, um, so after our final applause, I'd like to ask everyone else to give them a chance to uh, leave because they have to go to a, another event. Also, for students, uh, we have pizza in the foyer if you'd like to partake of that, and thank you all for coming.